uh, tonight we're here for a very uh, special night. This, this is to talk about three really uh, great projects in the city, three projects that will enhance our open space, give us more activity, more recreation. So um, it's a great opportunity. I know everybody was outside uh, getting free ice cream, some pizza, and, and a really nice night to bring some of the families out together, particularly before school night. Uh, so I want to just start by thanking a, a couple of the groups that have been instrumental uh, tonight and over the, the past couple of years. The Mystic River Watershed Association have been uh, superstars in the city of Woburn, and they've really worked great with us. Uh, the, the city engineer, Jay Corey, has, has, has made them uh, pr pretty much our main grant writer, and they've been doing some fantastic work. Uh, these three projects are primarily funded with grants, which is a good thing uh, because it means we don't have to use taxpayer money. Uh, so again, thank you for that. Uh, Teresa Murphy's here from Conservation. She's uh, helping with the project as well. I know we've got a couple members from Conservation and some city councilors as well who have been very supportive of the project. So thank you for everybody for being here. Um, just to, you know, if you don't know, I know you've all seen what the projects are a little bit about, but I'd just like to give a little um, explanation of what they are. First of all, starting with the Hurl Park. The Hurl Park is an 11.3 acre climate resilient park with a lower elevation and that's the, the north section which is for flood storage, wetlands and walking trails. The upper, the upper portion which borders along Bedford Road is being designed as a heat resilient park with recreation and community gathering space which will be great. Uh, right now we're, we've been lucky to uh, been working with Catherine Clark, she's in our, our congressional delegation and she's, sub, sub, she's actually secured $3 million in funding for the project. Uh, Rich Haggerty, who was out here earlier tonight, has been very supportive as well, and he, is, he secured a $300,000 planning earmark. And then again, uh, with the assistance of uh, the Mystic River and Jay Corey working on the project, we've got, a, we've got another about $800,000 in planning grants. So we're well on the road to making this project a uh, success. So everybody who's involved, you, you need a great round of applause for that. The next two I'll talk about briefly and then I'll move on and let the, uh, the experts talk about it is, again, two really great projects. Down at Han Pond, I know everybody knows that's the jewel of the city uh, and you see more people down there, more wildlife uh, all the time. And, and now uh, a fish ladder is being proposed uh, to be built down there and we received some funding from that um, in, in the tune of about a million dollars. And then the other project is another great one that's to shake a glen of people from the west side uh, there are some great walking trails already there. There's about 20 acres of open space. And we were able to obtain another 12 uh, working with uh, the alderman, the alderman at large and the city engineer. We were able to secure another 12 from uh, the Moolahs. They have a very generous corporation, a uh, great place to do food shopping too. That's where I go. But uh, <laughs> they donated 12 acres, which is really going to help out with the recreation down there. And just briefly where that funding came from, again, because these, these projects, again, it's important they're grant funded no taxpayer money for the most part, so it's a great thing. On January 11, 2013, the Bayer, Crop, the Bayer Crop Science Inc. and Pharmacia agreed to provide approximately $4.25 million to the Natural Resource Trust in order to resolve the environmental liability from the, Industri the Industriplex super site, which is, has been cleaned up. Uh, under the terms of the settlement, which was lodged with and approved by the U.S. US District Court, the trustees recovered their past costs and 3.8 have been made available to these two projects. So uh, this has been a long time coming and it's well deserved for the city. Um, so again, we're all excited about these projects. Everybody here who's participating, it's a great thing because this is your community. Your input here is, is going to be taken seriously by the city and uh, you, you know our grant writers and, and uh, planners. So thanks for taking the time out of your night and enjoy the presentation. So for that, yeah. Again, my name's Tony Zrilli. I work for Wesson and Samson Engineers, and, and working with the city, we are developing the Shaker Glen Extension as an ecological restoration project. Um, I don't want to repeat what, what the mayor stated, but I'll tell you what, working with a lot of municipalities, the city of Woburn's gone out of their way to... Sorry. Oh, sorry, his phone. <laughs> <laughs> to work on your behalf to get state and federal monies to do incredible projects. Um, you know, I work for an engineering company and we don't get to do projects like this all the time. So to, to be on one of these projects, working for an ecological restoration project to give something back to the community, it, you know, that, that's what, these are the types of projects we live for. 
Um, so the Shaker Glen extension, and I know outside we had a little bit of trouble orienting ourselves, so I'll get to, to that slide, but it's a 12 acre parcel. Um, it's adjacent to the Shaker Glen Conservation Area, which is located behind Lexington Avenue. Um, the restoration project is kind of got three goals. We want to enhance the ecological value of the property. We want to clean up the decades of debris that's been left behind. And we want to increase flood storage and mitigate flooding on the Four Corners uh, intersection just upstream from it. So in orientation, you can see the Four Corners is the intersection between Russell Street, Cambridge, and Lexington, uh, Lexington Street. Uh, the Shaker Glen extension is that 12 acre northeastern parcel, but the conservation area extends much farther to the south and to the, and to the west. I think it's an additional 20 acres. I mentioned flooding. This is the FEMA flood map, which shows that flooding actually goes above and beyond the Shaker Glen extension property. Um, if you look closely here, you'll see that the flooding actually extends out into these, these properties. Beyond the, beyond, the property, beyond the project limits. This is some of the flooding that was experienced in 2017 in the Four Corners area. And this is the existing site conditions uh, currently out there at Shaker Glen Extension. Uh, we have areas that have been culverted uh, with concrete culverts. We have a very incised stream channel. And then we have areas that are just bare concrete and pavement um, here's some other close uh, photos. I mentioned outside that I had a photo of the actual mosaic tile from inside, I believe it was the bowling alley out there, right? <laughs> um, and then there's some, another photo of pavement in the area that's kind of broken up. You can actually see trees are actually sprouting up from inside of the pavement or between the pavement. Um, and then this is just another example, and I, I know it's not too clear, but there's debris down here. There's a tire over here. There's an old uh, uh, sink that we found. It's just, it, it's just an area that has kind of been neglected and it's, it's, it's ripe for a, a reinvigoration and a, and a restoration. So the design matrix, some of the things we look at when we're trying to do a project like this. We've talked about the 12 acres. Um, we're gonna do 12 acres of restored conservation area with a realigned stream and create, with, with cr new created wetlands and 33,000 cubic yards of flood storage. Well, that got duplicated, I apologize for that. 200,000 square feet of quick created wetland habitat. I think that's one of the largest inland wetland habitat creation projects in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, 1,500 linear feet of new river, which equates to 3,000 new stream bank, or linear feet of stream bank. Gonna clean up about 75,000 square feet of debris and we're also gonna create an educational space, which I'll get to. We talk about, you know, we do these things and we create these huge restoration areas, but we wanna teach our children on why we did it and, and what the improvements are there for. Um, so we're, we're gonna build a park with signage that talks about the great, you know, the great work that's gone into this project. But we're also gonna create about 3,000 linear feet of new pathways. Those passive recreation is going to wind through the recreational area. We're going to have bridges that span some of the wetland created. Um, and it's also going to connect to the pathway system in the larger Shaker Glen conservation area. So the project components consisted of a wetland delineation and stream geomorphology uh, survey. So I got a question outside of how, do you, how did you realign that stream? We hired experts who know how to realign streams. They ran the analysis, they evaluated what's out there currently, and they put the best possible stream they could put onto that plan, and that's what you guys got today. Um, stormwater and resiliency flooding modeling, looking at the way stormwater flows onto the site and how floodwaters flow on are stored and flow off, and then site restoration design, and eventually into permitting. Uh, this is just, I, I included this, uh, this was the sign that was outside that was around the table. It talks about why you want to do ecological restoration, the benefits not only to the habitat and, and, and the animals and, and uh, vegetation that's going to be there, but also to the, to, the, to the human element, the access to a part of you know, the environment you might not ever see every day in Woburn and downtown. Um, in the bottom corner, there's a diagram just kind of shows how the site's going to work. 
every day, normal, normal flow conditions, stream will stay with it within the stream channel. During flooding conditions, it will overtop its banks, but it will stay <coughs> on Shaker Glen extension and, and be held within the, the river valley. So this is the site design that I was showing outside. What you see in red is where the construction debris is, right? Where past development has been made and left to rot. Pavement, concrete, rubble, um, the old foundation to the bowling alleys here. Uh, you can see where the stream channel kind of cuts through the middle of the property. Very straight, very narrow, very incised. Um, potentially, probably dug at one point to get the water to flow through the property. Um, it reaches the northern point against the Russell Street embankment, takes a hard right, goes through a series of culverts, and through four corners. The area in green that you see in the center of the property is, is existing wetland resource area. What we're doing is we're taking that stream channel outside of its banks. We're creating a more natural, sinuous stream channel that has multiple functions. It's better for habitat. It's actually better for vegetation. We've removed the element of erosion along the stream banks, or we've improved it at least, and we're keeping the water in a channel that is more natural than what is currently existing out there today. We're removing all of that debris that you saw in the previous slide, and in its place we're creating a lower floodplain and a wetland rec restoration area, so complete ecological restoration. Wetlands plantings, floodplain storage, and a new river system. We're also building a parking lot off of Russell Street for access, which is in that top right corner, and an elevated park just south of that. That park is that educational area that I was talking about. There'll be a kiosk there with signage and pamphlets to show and talk about what great things we're doing in the city of Woburn, or what great things you guys are doing in the city of Woburn. That park will have access to a series of pathways and bridges and, and, and recreational um, path system that will loop around the ecological restoration area and then connect down here to the larger Shaker Glen conservation area. All in all, it's about a half mile loop. It'll be a nice walking trail. You get to see you know, part of the a wetland that you probably wouldn't typically see. Um, related regional projects that connect to this. So this area drains east to Horn Pond and then eventually drains through Horn Pond Dam right towards the fish passage um, that my peer Justin's going to come up here and talk about in a minute. Another project that was completely funded from state and federal funding, it includes enhancement of Horn Pond Brook as well, so another brook restoration and another fish passage. So back to this project. After meeting tonight and getting some feedback, we're going to finalize the restoration design, submit permit applications, and head off to construction. So we have a website set up, the City of Woburn's website set up. There is information on all of these projects on that website, so you'll be able to access that at any time, check out the updates, check out what we're doing, um, and submit questions and comments. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes, please. Um, the river diversion that you're talking about, the stream, the pathways, yep. is that including the stream that's up behind Shannon Farm? in that part of Shaker Glen, because we have a lot of debris down there, we have a lot of we have bridges there that are unsafe right now. So you're talking about bringing bridges up. Are you going to fix those bridges there? So that's, that's not part of this project. This, th I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the larger Shaker Glen conservation area, yes. that one that exists to the southwest. Yes. That's not part of this project, but I know that the city's looking at, uh, at how this project will help enhance the larger conservation area as a whole and look at those items as a secondary to this project to try to enhance, well, a, 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 as another project to this. Okay, so but that, is that stream going to be affected by you diverting this new stream? No, the goal of this stream is to hold water on the site so it doesn't release downstream into the Four Corners. It won't have any impact backing up onto the other Shaker Glen parcel. It won't back up? No. Okay, thank you. We do have future plans to look at productivity of Shaker Glen, the Battle Road, to Westbury Gallery. But that's in the future. This is a standalone if you will. I'm wondering, too, if we want to in general hold questions yeah. at the end. Yeah, I was just going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the answers will be 
and I, I'm more than happy to come back up afterwards if you have more questions for me. Thank but, you. Yep. Hello, as Tony mentioned, my name's Justin Gould with Weston and Sampson, and I must say, I am very impressed with this turnout tonight. It's, it's amazing for the city how much interest the citizens take uh, and take pride in their, their community. So the project that I'm going to talk about is primarily the fish passage. There's some other elements of brook restoration that we'll touch on as well. So the fish passage itself is, just as the name um, implies, put in place to allow the fish access to the upstream pond. There's a, there's a couple of fish ladders downstream in the Mystic Lakes that can uh, get the fish up to Horn Pond, but current day there is no um, fish ladder for them to get into the pond. They are able to migrate somewhat through either the auxiliary spillway or with some help from some friends getting them up in there, but this is really the last sort of link in the chain to complete their migration as it was before, before all of these brooks were uh, touched by human hands. So there's a couple other elements that we'll, we'll touch on uh, in the beginning here, and then primarily get into the, the fish passageway itself, which you know, the mayor called Horn Pond the jewel of Woburn. Well, the, the fish passage is the jewel of, of this particular project here. So, so where we are in, in uh, the status of the project, we've completed all of the in-depth field investigations, surveys, hydraulic modeling, uh, modeling of the fish passage itself as well as the, the brook downstream, uh, completed regional, updated regional models for climate change purposes. So all that information is pumped into the design. We are in the final design phase. The plans that you saw are outside and we'll put on the screen in a minute are uh, probably 75, 70% design phase at this point. So one of the other features is a stormwater feature off of the parking lot next to where the fish passage will be. So uh, oftentimes called a rain garden, where runoff from these pervious areas is, is collected in this area and allowed essentially to filter out some of the contaminants that come off of the, from the parking lot in a rainstorm, that first flush of runoff. So as an improvement to the water quality in the pond itself, this rain garden stormwater feature will be adjacent to the parking lot and the fish passageway would be to the right of the page looking at this illustration. So these projects actually have started a few years ago so this one has been sitting waiting for the others to sort of catch up and they'll all be packaged together as one construction project because they're all adjacent to each other. The brook restoration so this is downstream of the dam. So on the other side of Lake Ave, there's you know, only a short stretch for, uh, to the, to, until you hit the Winchester line. But that section of brook will be restored. Over, over time, if any of you have walked along that little stretch or even just looked from the roadside, you know, there's been some intrusions onto the stream, some, some fill areas have been put in for parking and whatnot. Um, it's not all coming out, but we are going to restore some of the natural, uh, the natural conveyance of the stream there. Some of that uh, contributed to the flooding that happened a number of years ago through there, so that should open up the downstream of the dam, allow for a more free flow uh, during those high flow periods, but also we'll clean out all the downed trees and wood that's in there, and that will make it an easier passage for the fish to get to the dam. So that's a kind of a, a lead-in project to the passage itself. That work entails in the blue is where we're sort of reconfiguring what we kind of call the bump out. Um, they're shaving that down a little bit to straighten it out. So uh, currently it goes kind of up and to the left on the screen and there's a lot of scour on that side of the bank. So we'll be straightening that out, doing some bank uh, hardening to prevent future scour and like I said most of the stream you, you can't really see in this area it's, it's underneath the, the canopy but uh, cleaning out 
all of the down woods uh, and any trash and all that stuff that, that's in there. So from here, and the town line's just really off the, off the screen here, not far. And here's the dam course. So the fish passage, the crown jewel, so what is the fish passage? As we said, it's, it's there to help the fish get back to the pond. I mean, this is, in the, in the case of the, the herring, this is where they spawn up in these, these freshwater areas. So this is a large water uh, body that, uh, if all indications of what you know, happened in the lower stream, the, the last fish dam that, that was put in in 2012 ended up more than doubling the, the population of fish that were coming upstream. So we're not saying, suggesting this will double it, but certainly is going to promote uh, a great increase in the, in the total herring that in, in overall species that are, that are coming up um, the dream. So it could be even up to a million or some, some estimates, which would be incredible. The area, uh, every, you know, since this was conceptualized, where the dam sits adjacent to the pond that is accessed by so many uh, folks, I'm sure, in this room, um, that feature was, was extremely enticing, to have that public accessibility to this fish ladder. Most of the fish ladders uh, are not, do not have that accessibility. There's some that you never even see, you never know that are there. So having this public access, public ed education element to it, public viewing, the, the illustration of the viewing window, uh, and actually be, being able to see the fish migrate, you know, in the water is, is uh, pretty wild and, and it's very rare. So here's the fish ladder design itself. This is uh, from our design plans. Uh, the, there's many different types of fish ladders. This one is called a pool and wear natural like fishway. So the pools, the pools are created by these weirs that are ca capped with stone, and the nature-like passage is sort of emulating the stream, similar to what Tony was talking about at, at Shaker Glen. So each of those pools, it's about a eight or nine inch jump. So the fish, they enter down at the just below the dam. Uh, there's some some enhancements done there to sort of create the the current that draws them in, and they go from one pool to the next. And each of these weirs has a little chute, and that's where the jump is. So the water will funnel through there, the fish sort of rest in here, come up to the next one, so on and so forth, all the way up into the pond. This is a public access way to the viewing window, which would be right here. So on the flat area just before they get into the pond, if we're pro where we're proposing the viewing window. So that's a depressed area to get down to that, you know, below water level. So there's a handicap accessible ramp or some stairs to get down to that location. And the other nice feature is up in here, we'll have a whiteboard on the bottom. So for those folks that are standing, looking down into the passage, that white bottom will really enhance the, the fish, and it will be able to count the fish as they go by. So it'll, um, and I know the fish counting, some of you may have actually been, you know, volunteers to do fish counting, so, which is difficult in the existing area. So with this feature, it'll make, it a, make life a lot easier from that standpoint. The bridge in the middle, I know a few people were asking sort of what this was. This is just an access bridge to get to the dam since we're cutting it off um, from vehicle access, putting the fish passage in. So that's more of a, a maintenance element of the project to get to the dam so the city can do any maintenance or you know, routine stuff there. These views are pretty cool. I just wanted, these were on the boards outside, but you know the, the viewing window down there it won't be quite this tall. This is a little illustrative, but we envision sort of a half and half window where it'd be water down here and in, in, in space above. Um, and then if you're standing on the side looking out at the pond, you know, what you'll sort of see from that viewpoint. So I think it's really going to enhance 
uh, people wanting to visit this area, for better or for worse, you're probably going to get a lot of out-of-towners that want to come visit it as well. So, The two projects are on the same track. Tony touched on this, so both projects are get, getting submitted for, for permitting together. So we envision them on the same general construction um, calendar. Construction hopefully starting next year in 2024 and, and then extending into 2025. And I'll turn it over to the next one. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Um, my presentation is about the Hurled Park Climate Resilient Hub. Um, our project team um, consists of the mayor, uh, Jay Corey, the city engineer in the back, Jeff Dillon, who's been great, and uh, our colleagues, uh, Rory and Brian from um, the RAC department, um, who've been great. I don't think they're here tonight, but they've been great with helping us um, on the southern portion, which I'll get to in a second. Um, my name is Jennifer Relstab. I'm the project manager for Horsley Witten Group, and I have a great team. Um, my colleague Jonas is out um, on the table if you've met him. And of course, we've been working with Daria and Ka uh, Catherine um, from Myra. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time tonight talking about existing conditions and um, sort of the site assessment work. We've actually been working on this project for quite a long time. Um, the planning process started in, I believe, 2019, 2020. Um, and we actually developed the concept in 2021 and presented it to the public in June 2021. So uh, we've been working on this uh, for over two and a half years now. So I know I heard a lot of people say, when is this going to be built? Uh, but it is coming along, and we uh, have a lot of information on our website, which I'll uh, flash on the screen here at the end. Um, and all of the presentations, I think, are up there as well. Um, and if not, we do have um, some ability to talk about that after this presentation. But one of the things that people have been asking me is, where is this project? Where is Pearl Park? Um, so if you go uh, just outside, you can see Ray Rock Hill, and just on the other side of that is where Hurled Park is located. This is an aerial image of that, so you can see on the southern end of that almost 12 acres that the mayor talked about, we have the former Daniel Hurled Elementary School. Um, this is no longer operational. Uh, this is going to be uh, demoed. Uh, the city is working on that now. It has been permitted, and that will be done prior to our project. On the north side here, you have a basically a forested eight acres or so of area. Uh, historically was a agricultural uh, area um, and the Cummings Brook, which bisects it, uh, has been uh, dredged through, I think the mid century. Um, and then again, I think in the eighties. Um, but what you have on site, um, on the Northern side is a collection of sort of sec uh, secondary succession forest um, and some bordering vegetated wetland on either side of that Cummings Brook. Very similar to the Shaker Glen project, uh, we have very similar priorities in terms of restoring the site and really making that a project for all. Um, one thing you'll notice about our project, if you uh, didn't get to see it outside, um, we're really trying to make this an accessible uh, space for all, for all types of people and diverse backgrounds. Um, we recognize that we have a very significant environmental justice community within a mile of this project and really working to get people to the site um, acknowledging that as a climate resilient, heat resilient park, we really need to think about that in the future. Um, speaking of climate resilience, we're working on a design that's going to help with the flood mitigation. Obviously, again, heat resilience and thinking about that. And of course, uh, managing stormwater and cleaning it up um, using nature-based solutions. Um, and then lastly, with the park, we're really thinking about both active and passive landscapes uh, for our neighbors and neighborhoods and thinking about promoting public health. Obviously, through, the co uh, through COVID, we've had a lot of different experiences and we recognize that being outdoors is one of the great things um, about uh, Woburn especially, and so we want to enhance that with this project. So where we're at right now, uh, we're in design. We've completed a lot of the field work that needed to be done to get to where we are in the design today. Um, we're going to be finishing the design through the rest of this fall and start permitting at the end of the year and through 2024. 
So this is the overall concept. So uh, for those who uh, saw our presentation back in February, March of 2023, uh, this is, uh, I'll, I'll show another uh, image here of the southern side, but we did uh, update that a little bit. But uh, the, I think the northern part is part of the concept that I think most of the public has not seen since then. Uh, but what we're doing is sort of two different areas. On the north side, we're really focusing on doing a lot of the ecological restoration part. Um, we've got uh, a restored stream, so this is the new orientation, very much like Shaker Glen. We're increasing the sinuosity and um, putting it back into its sort of natural position. We have uh, boardwalks and pervious, so stone dust pathways that connect from Sheridan Street to the north all the way to the southern portion of the project, which abuts uh, Bedford Road. Uh, we are including a uh, boardwalk through the wetland, or that's uh, the current design, to really uh, give people an immersive sort of experience and have a little bit of adventure and seek sort of the nature part of this project out. Um, <clears throat> I'll highlight the southern portion in a second, but just to, to kind of uh, zoom into this space, in addition to those uh, trails and pathways on the northeast side, we have what is a constructed stormwater wetland. So it's very much like those existing wetland uh, that is out there right now, uh, but it's gonna focus on fo uh, managing the stormwater that's coming from Sheridan Street and actually Wind Street to the east. Um, and we're also gonna be incorporating some path uh, signage and also some seating areas, uh, recognizing that you know people wanna pause and do some birding, maybe enjoy um, some looking outside. So we have some photos here of things that we're thinking about in this project. On the left here, a boardwalk over the Cummings Brook. You can kind of see what we're thinking about in terms of that pervious pathway through the forested area. Um, these two pictures um, on the bottom here, this image on the left is uh, actually a, a seating a bench at Walton Pond, if, if, those are, if you've been, been there before. Um, this uh, seating area here, that's actually from Fuller Brook in Wellesley, but something like that, very similar to that in terms of seating areas. Uh, I mentioned stream restoration. So this is actually a Fuller Brook, this is a restored stream that Horsley Witten worked on, really focusing on kind of restoring some of the uh, non-native invasive species that are on site now um, to more meadow um, and naturalized uh, native species. And then on the bottom, that's a picture of a constructed wetland. So again, looks very similar to uh, what is out there now. As far as wayfinding and signage goes, um, we know we're gonna have trails that crisscross and loop throughout the space. So obviously having a trailhead and having some signage to indicate that will be helpful. Um, some trails may be marked a little bit differently. Maybe we'll have granite piers that indicate for the public uh, areas of access. Uh, to the right of that, interpretive signage, so educational signage. That'll be a big part of this project, really letting people know like what we're doing as part of the work here. Um, and then that last image here is just, you know, we know we're gonna have a lot of native plants, we're gonna do a lot of work on the invasive species, so really thinking about that and highlighting our native plants. So um, I'm gonna go quickly through this, uh, one, because I know you guys want to get out of here, but also uh, we did present this uh, several times this year. Um, but this is the southern portion of the pipe, the more, portion of the site, the more active uh, area. And so, uh, for those uh, who have asked me, this um, tree right here is the large maple tree that's in the front of the entrance of the existing school. Um, so the area to the back where the, uh, the words "open green" are, that's where the building is. Uh, so we're turning that whole area into flexible open space uh, for kids to go uh, kick soccer balls, throw uh, baseballs, do yoga, whatever. Um, the more active part is gonna be where the uh, asphalt parking areas are now. Um, so that includes uh, going from sort of north to south, pavilions, seating areas, misting stations, uh, splash pad, spray pad, um, sport court or basketball court, and some parking. These, all these images were shared previously, but I'll just go through them quickly in terms of what you can see. So pavilion, parking with shade, uh, so we're intending to plant around that area. 
for that active and uh, flexible open space. Um, you know, the ability to it's not, not program, not for soccer or intentionally for games or things like that, your sport court. Um, I may not have mentioned this, but the intent of the playground space is for both uh, young ages and older, five to 12, but to make it inclusive, accessible. So we have a lot of features, side amenities that are for those um, who have different abilities or maybe use a wheelchair um, and those who maybe have some sensory um, concerns. So we are trying to make it all inclusive, um, acknowledging that you know for the neighborhood that this would be sort of the best idea for us to sort of balance um, both the nature aspect and then the active play. And then finally, with the resilient heat features, we definitely uh, want to incorporate this, acknowledging like a night like tonight, um, you know, having these opportunities uh, for our kids. Um, so we have a, a splash uh, spray area, very similar to how the uh, clap is designed, um, some water play features as well, and then misting stations um, also. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned this already, but we've been working hard with uh, the city. Uh, this grant, uh, this work is being uh, done through an uh, existing municipal vulnerability preparedness grant. Uh, we have been uh, very lucky to work with uh, the Mystic River Watershed Association in getting grants uh, for this design to continue, as well as with the city uh, to apply for more funding for construction, as the mayor mentioned. Uh, so we are hopeful that uh, permitting gets done um, by 2024, 2025, and we're out to bid in 26. Um, and again, just for everybody, there is a website that you can go to where we have more information about this project. Thank you. Spaces you talked about, the play areas and things like that. Is there any thought of like exercise equipment, a park like ones that adults can go and exercise? And they, you know, I've seen those in London and they really tell you what to do. And you know, yes. you can be walking and doing that. Is there any thought given to something like that? Yeah. Um, so the 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 answer is we've definitely thought about sort of active and passive and for this particular project the majority of the focus has been on sort of the passive the nature base just given the proximity of the resource areas to the project that's why also the park is uh, pretty pretty close to the south or pretty close to Bedford Road because we didn't want to impact um, the nature and sort of native species um, but certainly something we can consider um, moving forward about any projects, too. Alright, so kids help, and do you guys want to come up? Sure. Alright. Uh, my question is, it kind of applies to all of them. Um, how do you maintain this over the years? Who cuts the grass, fixes the equipment when it breaks, and, you know, all, all of that. How does, how does it get, so it doesn't get in disrepair over the years? Rory's here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I, I think as far as the nature-based solutions is concerned, um, we obviously are keeping maintenance in mind when we design. We always design with that. Um, it's honestly a, the first question that comes to us from most municipalities. Um, so the, the point, uh, when we start to think about um, plantings, when we start to think about stormwater, when we start to think about restoration, really our goal is you know, trying to think about how can we make this the easiest as possible. So for us, we are focusing on really trying to use native plants. That's one thing that's always gonna be a benefit for, for us. And secondly, I think as far as the, the nature-based solutions is concerned, um, you know, using the types of materials like the stone dust that can be e relatively easily repaired and che more cheaply repaired. Um, to your question about the recreation part, the playground equipment and things like that, I mean, we are using, this particular site is using wood. Um, so most of the features, with the exception of some of the accessible uh, features, uh, which are, are metal or other, um, are gonna be made of wood and those have a longer um, life uh, time. And then in terms of some of the other things like, you know, the pavilion and things like that, those have pretty long, lifetimes without significant capital maintenance. Of course, there's regular maintenance, 
and we've discussed that significantly with um, Rory and her team and of course Jay and his team in terms of making sure that we're not having anything that needs to be mowed or irrigated regularly. Yeah, I feel like for Shaker Glen, there's a lot of similarities between the two projects, right? The idea of an ecological restoration site is that it, it kind of maintains itself. Obviously, invasive species is something we'd be very concerned with and something that we'd monitor over time and manage over time. But the idea is to, to, to plant the site with, with native species that, that can kind of grow and, and, and maintain themselves. For the pathway systems, much similar to Earl, it's uh, you know stone pathways that are low maintenance. Um, the bridges would be something that would have to be, you know, regularly maintained by the city um, and, and clearage of it, any debris. But there would be an operation and maintenance plan that would be put in for any kind of amenity like that. What they said. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the fish passage is a little different, obviously, than the other two. We don't envision a lot of maintenance uh, if debris does build up in the fish passage itself. There is provisions for stop logs up at the pond, so. In, a, in essence, the water can be stopped in, in, in the fish bashes access to remove that, but those are not envisioned to be frequent items of maintenance uh, for that process. I'll say one more. You know, this, this is a, these projects are large investments by a lot of different people. You know, I, I didn't mention when I was up at the podium earlier, but you know, this project was selected, or these projects were selected from many. Um, this is a collaborative effort between not just the city and their consultants and Mystic River, but through DEP and NOAA and Fish and Wildlife Services. There's a lot of people who've committed funds and time and money to this project to see it be successful. Um, so I think we all understand and they all understand what if they're investing that money, they expect these projects to be maintained and, su and survive for the long haul. So there's a lot of people behind these projects pushing this and making sure they're successful. It's not something that's gonna be developed and forgotten about. There's, a, there's large commitments here for these types of projects. Hi, uh, we live in the area of Herald, and there is quite a bit of wildlife <laughs> that uses that area as their habitat, and I'm curious as to what the proposed changes are going to do and how you consider that as coyotes. the impact on coyote, deer, foxes, foxes turkeys. turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Cameras in the yard pick up a lot of four and two legged creatures. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, I just want to say, I think, you know, our goal here is to make it better. If you've seen the site now, um, it looks forested and looks very nice and pristine. It's actually mostly invasive, non native, uh, again, secondary succession, um, formerly historical uh, egg area. And our goal here um, with the stream is to really restore that, not just for sort of land-based animals, but also aquatic wildlife, um, which we didn't really talk about in our project, but very similarly, we wanna keep that in mind as well. Our goal is to not um, completely demolish all the trees and um, wildlife that's out there. Um, it is a lot of invasive and non-native, but there is a lot of canopy, um, very large trees out, actually out there since mid-century, so many years of growing, and we want to keep that as much as we can. Um, I didn't speak about this, but in the existing conditions analysis that we did, we did identify a lot of um, dead trees or down trees, which is are used by um, several animals uh, as their homes and for food. Um, so things like that we'll try to replicate as part of the process, and we also uh, are being mindful. Uh, we've, we've been do doing a few of these different types of projects and we um, always see the animals come back. Uh, so we're not trying to keep them out. Um, and in fact, we're trying to, as far as the, the northern section, is keep those paths as much away from the stream as possible to allow for a sort of naturalized area. Um, and in fact, we're expanding the resource area through this design uh, for those animals. I also, I just had two quick questions about Hurled in specific, because I live in that area also. Um, I wonder what the final price tag is on what you're talking about, and how we did talk about grants, but mm -hmm. I think they're more in the three, four million dollar range. I wondered what this project actually cost. 
Um, so I'll say right now we're still in the process of finalizing the design for the northern section. We do have an estimate for the southern section, which I want to say is between three to four million dollars. Um, so in total, could be you know maybe six to eight million. Um, that's just literally an off the cuff estimate, yeah. and you know no no final answer there. Yeah, I just wondered how far we were from the actual amount. And yeah. This is just a quick question. Do you know what the difference will be between when the city next the school down and when uh -huh. you're? We're now talking 2026. I think you were saying. That's right. For building, so is that going to leave that into the? open knockdown no. stop space for that <laughs> No, and, and J. Corey just uh, slipped out. Um, but uh, no, so I, I know that the, the design has been permitted, uh, the no demolition has been permitted, so that, that has been in the works. The city is waiting to get that funded. Um, just given the fact that this project is moving forward and quickly, uh, to your point, we definitely don't want to knock that down and leave an open, vacant, empty space. We want to sort of work pretty fluently and from one project to the other. So our intent, I think, is to hold on that demo until we're ready to go, basically. Um, so it will happen before, but not uh, not before that. Not next week. Not next week. <laughs> So we have a mother deer and a baby deer there now. We have all these animals. And I know I've talked to Jeff about this a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But when you bring those bulldozers in, all those animals are going to go, right? We have coyotes that have their babies there. Now they've had them there all summer. We have bunnies. We have turtles. When you bring those bulldozers in, all those animals, what are they supposed to do? So I'll just talk a little bit about the permitting process. Um, as part of the permit process and the document, so you're seeing a lot of the engineering side as part of the documentation that we have to do for the permitting. We actually have to go through a process of what they call an environmental impact statement or EIS uh, through MEPA, which is the uh, Massachusetts Environmental Oh, the whole is act, thank you. I always think it's something else. Um, but in any case, we have to go through a process where they ask us to tell them about all the information on site, and we have to provide what they call an alternatives analysis, uh, which will have to include essentially all of the thoughts of what is on site, how we're dealing with it uh, through design through construction. And that process will allow all of the regulators to chime in uh, from the state to the federal to the local, um, including our commission, um, on what happens um, when we go through the process of construction. Um, for some sites, um, for example, you mentioned turtles, um, and there are other animals like this. We do have very specific protocol um, that needs to be followed for those types of, uh, for certain types of sensitive species. Um, where you do have to go in and um, clear the site, for example, of the animals while you're doing construction. Um, I don't have an answer for you right now about that because we're not at that point. Uh, we will be getting to that point at the end of this year. Okay, all right, my next question is, we have heard that there's going to be a parking lot on the Sheridan Street. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that true? That is currently in the design. We heard feedback from, um, Jeff and others uh, at along Sheridan Road that there was an interest in having something that was uh, more formal to decrease the uh, street parking. Um, so there is currently, I think, in the design about six to eight spots that are um, in that uh, area on Sheridan Street. Okay, first of all, it's a street with no sidewalks, with kids riding up their bikes up and down the street. The upper part of the street has cars on both sides all the time. Second thing is, how can you put a parking lot on conservation land? It's not conservation land as far as I know. Since when? I've lived there 42 years and it's always been conservation Okay, land. well, I'll ask <laughs> someone else from the city to comment on that. Yeah, but, yeah, but, if I could, yeah. sure, absolutely. I'm um, Jay Corey, I'm the city engineer. The reason we have a limited number of parking spaces down there is when we had a number of um, uh, neighborhood meetings with Jeff, uh, we talked to a bunch of people. We talked to the handicap commission. We have to have handicap accessible parking at both ends of the parks. It's required. So in order to put a, a handicap space there, we figured there's enough elderly and other people that might want to only access the bottom part of the park. So again, it's six spaces. I don't see it as being problematic. 
It's not. Okay. We all have. Oh, okay. If I can just finish. Again, six basins. It's not going to be. It's not like you're going to have traffic going in and out of there. You're going to have a car go in, use the park for three or four hours, and then leave. And if it's handicapped. Yes. And you're so making gravel pathways. How is the wheelchair going to go They're on? Accessible this pathways. What does that mean? Accessible to all. What's that mean? What what are you putting down oh. that um, a wheelchair? Can you it's a stabilized stone dust. Um, it's accessible um, through, uh, if you've been to any of the Mass Audubon trails that are all uh, abilities trails, they have the same thing. It's, a, it's called a stabilized stone dust. It has a component in it that allows it to be more firm to the, to the foot um, and more stable um, than, say, a gravel, which is what you're speaking of, or a pea gravel, for that matter, um, which is some of our other trails are like that. Okay, well, I live right across from there, and I don't like the fact that there's going to be a parking lot off our street when it's a small street, no sidewalks, kids there constantly, and you say it's handicapped, but you don't know what happens on our street at night. We have beer bottles, we have um, Dunkin' Donuts. That parking lot, guarantee, will be used for kids all night long. I, I understand the concern. I'm happy to talk about this more. I'm sure Jay is as well. and. Uh, take your comments. I know that our intent here is really to open the space. Obviously, um, there are always opportunities for people in parks to do illicit activities. Um, but obviously, what is there now is, you know, it's not very open. So those activities are, as you mentioned, already happening um, with or without a parking lot. So I, I, I think I'm happy to, you know, take more questions or, uh, from you or others. I live at 41 Sheridan, and my house is directly across the street from that parking lot. I have kids, I have a, I have a puppy, and we back in and out of our driveway all day long. Mm -hmm. We have three cars, and we just go back and forth all day long. I'm very concerned that I'm going to look that at look at this parking lot from my picture window instead of the nice green space that I currently look at now. So I'm not happy at all about this project. At the park, buying by what's happening on Sheridan Street and across from my home, mm -hmm. that I plan on being there forever, um, I'm not happy about it at all. Hi, my question is regarding accessibility as opposed to um, compliance. Mm. Uh, it's a two different things in talking about the pathway um, when you're in a wheelchair. That is very difficult, but this is for all three projects. I'm loving the idea that the, the fish ladder is going to have the handicap ramp um, as well as the viewing for anyone that's in a wheelchair. I love the fact that there's gonna be a playground for accessibility for the kids, which is long needed in Newburn. Um, but is there somebody that takes part, um, that knows about accessibility as opposed to compliance for these things? So we have, um, so to your point, there is sort of the ADA compliance uh, aspect, and we are uh, acknowledging that in our design with, um, so you have to have less than 5% grade uh, difference differential as you go on, and then a 2% uh, or less cross path. So um, that, in, in terms of all our paths, um, are, are gonna definitely be compliant. In terms of accessibility, we have had several conversations, and I know Jeff has had some conversations with neighbors about that. Um, and there, I think, I believe that we've also had conversations, like Jay, I think, mentioned this as well, is in terms of handicap and ADA um, coordinators in the city, um, working with them to really make sure that, you know, their needs are being met. Um, and again, with the neighbors as well, just trying to make, make sure that everybody feels comfortable now um, as part of the assessment, um, site plan reviews and things like that that will happen through the city, we'll obviously be speaking to that. Addition, um, in addition to the permitting for the environmental work, we'll also have to go through site plan review and things like that with the city. So um, we'll be addressing that with them during that process. Yeah, I, I, I think 
I'll speak for Justin as well because I was involved with the discussion on Horn Pond. I think that was a, a primary importance to have that ADA accessible pathway down to that fish ladder and have that window be accessible for somebody in a wheelchair that they could they could enjoy that view as well. Um, for Shaker Glen, we're kind of starting with a with a with a blank slate, right? So um, accessibility is, is is very important. We do have some some pinch points we're looking at currently to make sure they are accessible. We have been working with Jay and members of the city to address those concerns. Um, but that is an area that we are currently looking at to make sure that we're not only in compliance, but we're accessible to everyone. Um, those pathways and those bridges can be can be problematic, and, 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 but that's that's one of our priorities to make sure that not only they have access to this part of Shaker Glen, but the pathways that connect to the other parts are, are also improved and, and looked at. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Hi, this is about the, the Herald Park. Uh, are you planning on dredging or the riverbed on the other side of Sheridan? Uh, last time the city did some work there, uh, we, our backyard flooded and all those houses. Um, we are, as part of the modeling work um, that we're doing, looking at the section between Wynn Street and Sheridan Street. Um, I know that the city has looked at this as part of their hazard mitigation program on the area around Wynn and upstream of that. I know that they're looking at maintenance and, and considering those options there. Um, but certainly, as part of this, we'll be evaluating the impact of this project and then also potentially also looking at scenarios of um, maintenance and or maybe upgrades to those um, structures as well as part of a future project um, to acknowledge that, you know, obviously there has been flooding historically there. Um, and when we met with um, FEMA on site a few months ago, they did ask us about that, whether we were doing some analysis. Um, so it's not part of this project specifically, but we are starting to look at that, just very similar to the Horn Pond and Horn Pond Brook. You know, they're connected, and so we're wanting to take a look at that to see what the impacts are, but um, again, not part of this project, so no, we're not dreading <laughs> up there now. already a path that cuts through to the back of the road. Is there any thought about like, working off of that path and just expanding that path and making that some of your parking? Which we would have to cover you. Um, to, to what you need to cover for the clients. Yeah, so I it's just different. There's no, there's no, nothing kind of directly across. I mean, it is, uh, there's actually. Yeah, but so I. That's that's been about, where that's a little more out of sight. Yeah, so I. <laughs> so I, the um, answer is no, and I'll say it's because um, in terms of the stormwater treatment, we have, a, I think it, it's the northeast corner, is I think what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, of the property. Towards, uh, towards, towards Wind Street. Towards Wind Street. Yeah, mm hmm. That's right. So yeah, that path exists now, um, and that's actually where we're going to be putting a path in the in the design. We didn't look at it because that area, um, just in terms of stormwater, it's actually the best location for us to manage the stormwater from a site location in terms of the drainage pipes and elevations, topo, etc. Um, so that was n was never considered. Um, I will say there were options where we considered no parking lot at all. Um, actually, the initial design that we presented, and in fact, I think the last de design we presented in March had no parking lot on that side. Um, and it's it's only been implemented since then because we had comments and feedback about having um, parallel parking on Sheridan and concerns about that that we incorporated that because um, again we, we do need to have accessible um, access to that side so that is why it's on site now and not on the right on the road. Pathway we're talking about is a sewer. 
There is a sewer underneath. Underneath it. Yeah. So what's going to become of that? It's going to stay as it is now. And you're going to make it better there, or because. Uh, in terms of the pathway, you're gonna dig it out there. What are you gonna? No, no, it's just it's meant. We're we're basically the path in its existing form is an asphalt path. I think it's, it's yeah yeah it's a uh, maybe five feet wide. I think we're gonna make all of our paths six feet wide, uh, permeable um, uh, stone dust, stabilized stone dust. Um, so there is a little bit of work that will be done, but our intent is not to disturb or trench in any way any of the utilities that are in that particular area. Uh, we are doing um, other utility work across the site for stormwater purposes, um, mainly um, some water lines that we need to have because of the um, splash pad and misting stations and things on the southern side, but, but not, no utility work um, on, that, on that eastern side. So it's just going to stay from Bedford Road to Sheridan? Yep. Stay as it is. Well, right, but as a, a different uh, material. Okay. And, and where is there going to be an entrance on this, um, um, the other, towards Sheridan? Is this going to be? This it's going to be this, yeah, I think it, the same. It'll be look exactly the same in terms of the configuration. We're not changing that at all. We, we will have paths that connect into that space from the western part of the project, but um, it'll st it's staying in its existing configuration, um, acknowledging that everybody is, or uh, people who use that site are using it already, so we're not trying to change use patterns in any way. And obviously, given the um, a proximity to the wetland that exists there now, we don't want to go any you know closer to that with a at-grade path. You know, we, that's part of the reason we're doing a, a more immersive wetland a boardwalk. Um, inside of the site. Well, there used to be a field out there, a small field. Mm. And they, they, they had field day and things from the hurls and walked down. Mm -hmm. Now, that's gone, all, you know, it's long gone. It was, you know, it's just got overrun and nobody kept it going. It looks like it's just going to be similar to that. In terms of the path, but not in terms of the way it looks. So right now you see a lot of, again, invasive uh, species. If you stop by our table, there's a lot of, um, we've got garlic, mustard, knotweed, uh, tree of heaven. There's a bunch of stuff that's on that side dumping, <laughs> you know, of people's, um, you know, grass and things like that. Our intent is through this project, um, very similar to Shaker Glen. You know, invasive management is going to be a big part of this project. We acknowledge that again on that northern side. It's been untouched for 50, 60 years. There's some good species on site, and some, some not as great. But yeah, so so a lot of what's taken over. We've got a lot of bittersweet. If you've been out there, there's a lot of vines choking some of the trees now. Yeah, so a lot of that work will happen with this project, potentially in advance of this project. Um, in fact, a lot of uh, projects that we've been doing recently in terms of restoration, we've been, um, you know, suggesting um, if there's, you know, money available to do some of that work in advance, just to start to open the site, give it some sunlight, you know, allow some of those native species to thrive. So, Thank you. yeah. Sorry, I'm noting we're at. 7.25, so we probably have time for one quick last question if anyone has yeah, it, and if one. not, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. One quick one. Uh, sure. Do you have any plans to... Do you want to say this just so everyone can hear it? <laughs> <laughs> do you have any plans to replace the fence on the southern section off of Bedford Road? On the change? western side or the no, eastern no. side? If you're looking at the school... Yep. The yeah, on the western side. Um, we have had those conversations with us. So there's actually several fences because there's um, the personal private fencing and also the um, chain link fence, which runs along, which is, I assume, what you're talking about. We have had conversations about that. I think, to be honest with you, the majority of the conversations we've been having is not to fence it at all. Um, but where we where there is fencing, we would probably you know replace it. Um, I don't in my head, I don't remember what the condition of that is, but I think that's that, oh, there's the only that section, right? And then the rest is sort of vinyl fencing in private. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think we want to, um, you know, n cut off access from, you know, the adjacent homers, but I think in that particular area, there already is fencing. So we probably would remove it um, versus replacing um, unless there was a concern. Uh, well, yeah, I have a concern that's around my property. Okay. <laughs> it's probably it's 200 feet deep by probably 150 feet, so it's probably 350 feet. Up. 
Okay. Chain link. Chain, Chain link. link. It's, yeah. 60, it's 60 years old. Yeah. Um, and I'll just add to that, um, we are incorporating um, plantings, pretty dense plantings, actually, shrubs and plant, um, trees along that edge, which I know we've had conversations about with um, some of the other butters, um, which will in, in intentionally keep people from being along the property line, also providing canopy and shade and such on the inside of interior of the park as well. Okay. We have about two minutes left. Okay. Um, when you're making your paths, what about the houses that are on Bamberg? How close are these paths going to be to the neighborhood? Yep, so mm -hmm. So um, the pathway, actually, we, we had some public comment about that in, um, back in the earlier part of the year. Um, so actually, the paths, which are on the southern side, are a little bit closer just because we have the parcel skinnies out um, as you approach Bedford. On the northern side, where it's a little bit wider, we are, uh, with the exception of the existing path, which is staying where it is, um, we're pulling away um, from the houses on Bamberg. So we're 50 plus uh, feet away from those backyards in this current design. Sorry, what about the front on Sheridan? How deep are they from there? Pretty far. You know, once, we, once you get um, off the parking lot and into the trailhead, I want to say it's you know, 50 to 100 feet, it's it's fairly off. We did have a configuration where we had it on the uh, road, I think, um, sort of addressing a concern about no sidewalks. We didn't want to have, you know, people adjacent to the road acknowledging it was pretty narrow there, so we've pulled all those in as well, just to make sure that a lot of the um, active passive is inside the space and not on the exterior. All right, thank you, everybody. I just want to honor everybody's time at 7.30. Before I pass it over to Jeff, I'm going to let you close things out, Jeff. I just want to remind everybody that there is a website, a project web page for each of these projects on the city's web page. So feel free to go there. We continue to update it with new information. There are recordings there, and there's also an email sign up. So if you go there and sign up, we will send you updates. Um, and thank you all. Thank you, three, and thank you, everybody, for coming out. Sure, thank you. Um, I've lived there all my life, many of you know that, and I understand that sometimes change is difficult. We're used to things. We like things the way they are, and that works often. But we're coming to a time where we're having different climates. Who knew we'd have 95 degree days in September? <laughs> this is all positive things. I understand it impacts some people a little more than the others, and I, that's why we're here, and I appreciate you coming here, because this isn't something we're trying to ram down your throats or just force upon you. All I ask is to do what you're doing now. Come, keep an open dialogue, and let's work to try to take care of any concerns you have, because I know I don't want anyone to be unhappy, but what we have to realize we have to accept change, and we have to look at what's coming down the pike with the climate change, whether it's our own doing, whether it's the environment. The bigger and smarter people than I can't answer that. But it's here. So if this is something that's going to help my grandchildren, your kids in the future, we're doing the right thing. We're here. We're having an open dialogue and just keep an open mind. One of the things I did want to say is, I think it's important, which you go, Jen, <sighs> how many trees are we putting in there? I want to say it's over 200, 250 maybe. So that's, that's a lot of trees. Yes, there's some coming out, but the ones that are coming out have either been invasive or past their prime. So the, the other thing just to bear in mind is that this is the place to state your piece, and I do appreciate you coming, and um, try to work it out, make everyone as happy as we can, and uh, I think it's going to be a great thing, we just got to give it a chance. Thanks. Thank